Hey guys, Jay here with Word of Advice TV. Many of you already know this, but for those of you that don't, I work on appliances for a living. And besides heating and air conditioning, I also work on ovens, fridges, washers, dryers, water heaters, and all kinds of other stuff. And I've already got a couple videos out there of top 10 problems for furnace, AC, and water heater. And now I thought I'll make one for the oven as well. And for ovens, I work on gas ovens, electric ovens, cooktops, both electric and gas, and wall ovens. So I looked through the last year and a half or two years of records. I log all my calls every house I go to and briefly what I did there. I looked through all those calls, I marked all my oven calls and I categorized them and I organized this list right here of the most frequent oven problems and when I say oven I'm referring to oven, cooktop, and wall oven kind of all together and that's how I came up with this list I categorized all the problems and then I tallied up how many calls I had for each of the problems to come up with my top 10 list. So there's one side and I got a couple more on the other side here. And I'll go over the top 10 and then briefly I'll go over the honorable mentions after the 10. Okay, without further delay, let's just jump right into our list. Our champion, the guy in first place, is a bad ERC, electronic range control or clock sometimes it's called. That one had 45 calls. So 45 calls, bad electronic range control, which is this guy right here. It's the control board up on top that controls the oven. And it has a timer, you know, if you want to time cook something. It has the bake, the broil, and then it has a convection fan. If you have a convection fan, start, cancel, etc., etc. And the symptoms of a bad clock or electronic range control right here Sometimes the display will be completely faded out or half faded out. Some of the numbers will be missing. Other times there's buttons that don't work on them. There's times where you press bake and it doesn't bake. It's the board is not sending power to the bake element or the broil element. There's also times where the control board does not communicate correctly with the oven temperature sensor and the temperatures go kind of haywire. It gets too hot or it doesn't get hot enough. So there's a bunch of reasons that could cause that electronic range control to go bad. And number one problem for ovens for both electric and gas is a bad electronic range control board right here. And just so you know, whenever you replace an electronic control board on an oven, that overlay, or basically that white or black or whatever color that you have, that sticker that's on top of the control board with all the buttons on it, that is just a thin sticker on most control boards and that sticker gets plastered on top of it. So if you're gonna be ordering yourself a new control board, always get yourself the overlay along with it. And another thing I wanna point out is that in this video, I'm not gonna actually take apart any of my oven to show you how to replace any of the components, but just so you know, there's a bunch of videos online that can help you step by step and show you how to replace any parts on your oven if you wanna do that yourself. All you gotta do is just type in the brand of your oven. So for example, you would type in Maytag oven, how to replace bake igniter. And there's gonna be a bunch of videos out there that can lead you step by step how to replace that igniter or whatever part it is that you're replacing. That being said, if you're watching this video because you're having some kind of an oven problem, chances are your problem will be covered in this video because I go over a lot of the problems and I briefly explain what's causing them and so forth, so forth. But anyway, let's move on to problem number two, and that's a bad or weak bake igniter. That one had 32 calls. So a bad or weak igniter, if you have a weak igniter, if you open your door and you just hold the door switch in, usually the door switch will be on top, on either the left or the right side. If you open your door, hold the door switch in so that light bulb doesn't come on, and set your oven to bake, and you just look through the slots, most ovens will have slots, on the right and left side on the bottom panel. If you just look in those slots, you should see an orange glow. That's the glow of the hot surface igniter. If you're seeing the orange glow and just sit there and listen, if you're not hearing the gas get ignited for a long time, like 30, 40 seconds, the thing is glowing, but nothing is lighting, you're not hearing that poof where the gas is released and lit, that means you have a weak igniter. If the igniter is not drawing enough amps because it's weak, the gas valve will not open to allow the gas to go through because if you have a weak igniter, it might not be glowing hot enough to light that gas. The majority of the igniters that I replace are weak igniters or they're just completely failed igniters 
where it doesn't glow at all. So the igniter is getting 120 volts, but the igniter does not glow at all. A lot of times you'll actually see a crack in that igniter. That means it's burnt out. And those igniters are pretty simple to replace. Usually they're just held in there by two screws after you take the bottom panels out. And then if you get lucky, the new igniter will come with the same plug. You can just simply unplug the old one, plug the new one in, and you're good to go. If not though, that's not a big deal. You can just snip off the old plug and wire nut the new igniter to that old plug and it'll work that way. So long story short, I replaced 32 of those igniters. And coming in in third place is a bad infinite switch with 29 calls. And an infinite switch will only be on electric ovens or cooktops. And the electric infinite switch, it'll look like this switch right here. But you'll have usually two of them on one side and two on the other. And those switches are the ones that turn on your burners up on top, the electric burners. And the symptoms of a bad infinite switch, usually it'll be either the switch does not turn on the burner at all or sometimes it turns it on sporadically, it won't stay on all the time, or there's times where you turn it on and the burner just never goes out. You know how the electric elements, they glow red and then they go out? They glow red and then fade out, they just kind of keep pulsating like that? If you have a bad infinite switch, and when you turn on that burner, it just keeps glowing and glowing and glowing and never going out, that means most likely that infinite switch is bad. So I replaced 29 of those infinite switches and they're fairly easy to replace. You just pull the knobs off and typically there will be two screws that hold that infinite switch in. Of course you want to have the power off. Then you pull that knob off, you pull the oven out, take the back panel off and that infinite switch it will just kind of drop down. And what I like to do is to put in the new infinite switch right away. Put the screws in so it's held in place. And then I just kind of go wire by wire and plug each wire into the new one. Or you could just take a picture as well, take all the wires off and do it that way with a picture. I find it easier to just go wire by wire. And coming in in fourth place with 28 calls is a bad bake element. And of course this is only for electric ovens. The bad bake element will be on the bottom. Most of the elements that I find bad are the ones that are exposed. So when you open the door of your oven, you see the element right on the bottom there. Usually the bake elements that I see go bad are doughs. There's also bake elements that are concealed. There's that panel, the bottom panel is over the element. And there's others that have the bake element on the side of the oven. Those are pretty rare. But the most common one on older ovens is where that bake element is not concealed. It's just right on top and you can see it. A lot of times what will happen is some oil will drip on it or some other kind of liquid will drip on a portion of the element and it'll create a hot spot. And that hot spot tends to be the spot where it burns out. So a lot of times the customers say what happens is they're cooking a turkey or whatever it is they're cooking. Usually the oven goes out on Thanksgiving, right? So they're cooking the turkey and all of a sudden they say they hear sparks just sparking all over. They open up their oven and they see the element sparking like crazy. So they shut everything off, they turn the breaker off. And when I get out there, I start looking at that bake element and usually there will be either a piece of it that's burnt right through, might be a few pieces already on the floor. So I make sure the power is off, I clean all of that stuff out, take the old one out, put the new one in, and you should be good to go. If you're replacing a bake element, a lot of times the wires going into the bake element have enough slack on them. So you can actually take the old element out, make sure the power is off of course, take the old element out, typically held in by two screws, and slide it out, you should be able to slide it out far enough to get the wires to slide out with it. That way you don't have to pull the oven out and work on it from the back. And then make sure the wires don't kind of fall back into the oven. Put the new bake element in, put those wires back on and slide it right back in. A lot of times I replace the bake element without having to pull the whole oven out. Also, if you're disconnecting power from an electric oven, also a lot of times if you take the bottom drawer completely out and just look underneath the oven, most of the time the plug, the big 220 volt plug, is going to be on the bottom and it's visible and very accessible. So instead of having to pull the oven out or go turn off a breaker, you can just reach in there and pull that whole plug out, disconnect your power, and then you can start working on your oven. And coming in in fifth place with 20 calls is a bad temperature sensor. And temperature sensors will be used in both gas and electric ovens. So in the oven section, usually towards the top, either the left or the right, you're going to have a little probe that sticks out, usually held in there by one screw, 
Replacing one of those is super easy, but you do have to pull the oven out and get to it from the back. But the symptoms of a bad temperature sensor is that your temperatures are either going to be too high or too low. And just so you know, a lot of people know this, but for those of you that don't, the temperatures on both gas and electric, it doesn't matter what you set it to. For, so for example, let's say you set it to 350, it will not be a steady 350. What it'll actually do is bounce around under and over 350 and optimally have 350 be the medium point or the middle of the bouncing range. So for example, what I often see is if you set it to 350, it'll bounce from about 335 or 325 to about 375 and it'll just keep going up and down, up and down. The burner will come on or the bake element will come on. It'll heat it up to about 375, turn off. It'll cool down, cool down, cool down until it reaches 325, turn back on, heat up, and it just keeps doing that over and over and over. And if you have a bad temperature sensor, then that range gets all messed up. Sometimes it'll go way too high. It'll go up to, you know, like 400, 420, and then go down to 350, and then go back up and keep doing that. Or sometimes it'll be too low. It'll go from 300 to 350 and go back and forth there. And if your temperatures are out of range like that, then the temperature sensor just needs to be replaced. And the way I usually check it is with a meter, with a temp probe that you can plug into it. And then I put that in the oven and I monitor the temperatures live as it's in bake and just watch it cycle on and off and see where the temperatures are. And coming in in sixth place with 19 calls are parts that are no longer available. So I had 19 calls where the part that I needed, I had to order it, but it was no longer available unless you buy it off of eBay or some other refurbished source. But there's a lot of times where parts that you need for appliances are obsolete. They don't make them any longer. Oftentimes it's the control board that they no longer make. You can't buy it anywhere. Sometimes it could be something else like uh, orifice holder or like a burner or some other part that you need. And I'm sure you've heard this a bunch of times before, but they really don't make appliances to last a long time anymore. It seems like the parts for them are less and less readily available. In fact, just not too long ago, I had an LG fridge that had a bad control board. And on that refrigerator, it was only three years old. I tried to order that control board and it was no longer available. So that was kind of a record setter for me. I mean, that's pretty amazing. The fridge is three years old. It cost them $2,000 and the board is no longer available. Luckily with Maytag's Whirlpools and those other American brands, the parts do stick around for at least 10, 15 years. After that, they get harder and harder to find. But unless you have a really old oven, usually you should be able to get the part that you're looking for. And coming in in seventh place with 17 calls is a bad surface element on an electric oven or a cooktop. And those surface elements, they do fail. And what that will usually look like is, you know, you turn your infant switch on and absolutely nothing happens. It doesn't come on at all. Or if you have an oven that has dual elements, the one with the inner ring and the outer ring, sometimes just one of the rings dies and the other ring stays intact. In that case, you have to end up replacing the whole element itself. And those are pretty easy to replace. You just take this top off and those elements are generally held in there by long metal brackets. So you take those two brackets off and the elements just come right down. They're not too bad to replace. What I usually end up doing is turning off the power. There's two screws that hold the top. Typically, take those two screws out. I prop the top open, and then I just take two nut drivers. I usually have a 5 16 and a quarter inch nut driver with me all the time. And I just use those two nut drivers to prop up either side of the oven and make sure they're in there nice and sturdy. If they're not, then you're probably better off just sticking a box or something on either side to make sure that it doesn't fall while you're working on it. And better yet, some ovens actually, the whole entire top can come off and you just flip it over. There's a few Molex plugs in the back, you just unplug those plugs and you can take the whole entire top off and flip it over and it's super easy to work on it that way. So I ended up replacing 17 of those burner elements and coming in in eighth place with six calls are bad door hinges on the oven. And a lot of times when the door hinges are bad in the oven door, you'll see brown marks on this front panel up in front here because the door doesn't close all the way. So heat starts to escape and just browns out this top panel right here. And most of the time, the reason the door hinges go bad or they're bent is simply because 
somebody opened the door and either kneeled on it, sat on it, put something on it. Most of the time the door hinges don't just go bad. Somebody must have pushed down on them. So I ended up replacing six sets of door hinges to fix that problem. And in ninth place we have a three-way tie, all of them having five orders each. And I'll just start with the first one on the list here. Burner tube assembly kit. So five of those I replaced and the burner tube kit Usually it's the burner tube and the igniter that comes with it. Usually the burner tubes will look very similar to each other, if not identical, for the bake portion and for the broil portion, if you have a broil side. And of course these are only on gas ovens, the burner tubes. So those burner tubes, once in a while ovens or manufacturers will update the burner tube where they will place the igniter a little bit differently. Or other times if we're having grounding issues, Sometimes it helps to just replace that whole burner tube and that tends to solve the problem. Also, when I replaced that whole burner assembly with the igniter, one of the older techs I worked with kept telling me all the time that I should be grounding it and that's helped me a lot in the past. So that burner tube, whenever you get the new one, you should take a piece of green wire and just ground it from the burner tube to the chassis or the cabinet of the oven and that will help a lot if you have a spark igniter that way it'll spark every time without fail. Otherwise, once in a while, what happens is it keeps sparking, but it fails to light. And lastly, if the burner tube is all rusted out or it just looks really nasty, then I would just order the whole burner tube along with the igniter as well. And the next one in ninth place with five calls is a loose wire connection or a burnt connector at the burner or the infinite switch. And this problem usually happens with electric ovens. So those surface elements, that are underneath that ceramic glass top. Sometimes what happens is the wire or the wire connections to them burn out. And even though the infinite switch is not turning on the burner, it's not the burner that's bad. You simply have a burnt out wire. So in those cases, I would just snip that connector off, put a new connector on, plug it right back in, and it turns right back on. I've also seen burnt out connections in the back where the infinite switch is. And once again, you would just snip the burnt connector off, put a new one on, plug it in, and it should work. And the next one in ninth place is a seized up orifice holder. So this only applies to gas ovens or cooktops. So these orifice holders is what you call the things that hold these knobs to light your burners. So here you see the shaft. The shaft is connected to a little valve which opens and closes to allow the gas to come through. And sometimes these orifice holders the shaft will get completely seized up. Um, it could be because of just time, wear and tear, you know, as you're moving it so much, it just seizes up with time, or maybe some kind of oil or liquid got into it, and that caused it to lock up. But you go to turn the switch, and it's just completely locked up. You can't turn it at all. In that case, you would have to just replace that whole orifice holder. And on that note, I also want to point out that if you're working on a gas oven and you're going to be taking the top off to, for example, replace either a burner head or replace an orifice holder, or if you're replacing a little electrode, an igniter, spark igniter, and you have to take the burner off to do that, sometimes the screws that hold the burners in, see how my burner came right off? On my oven, the screws hold this plate down right here, and I can see them, they're a quarter inch, they're not rusted or anything. But there are times where the screws go into the burner and a lot of times those screws that go into the burners are completely rusted out. When you try to take them out, the screws just strip out and there's nothing you can do. So you end up having to drill through those screws in order to take that burner off. So if you know that you're going to be ordering parts for your oven and you know that you're going to be having to take those burners off, before you order parts, I would look at those screws and see if they're completely rusted out. And what I like to do is to take my drill and actually take all the screws out and make sure they all come out. And if there's some that don't come out, then I know that I need to order some extra screws. And if you can't find yourself any screws, you could just set the burner right back down without screwing it down and it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's better if it is screwed down, but even if it's not, if there's no screws in there, it'll still work. But anyway, let's move on to problem number 10. And once again, in 10th place, we have a three-way tie, each of them having four calls. And I'll just start from the top one, which is a bad convection fan motor. And that one's pretty easy. I mean, you pull the oven out, 
and you check with the meter if the motor is getting 120 volts. If it's getting voltage but the fan is not spinning, then you know that that motor is dead and needs to be replaced. But if the motor is not getting 120 volts, even though you're setting it for the convection fan, then there's probably something wrong with your control board not sending power to that motor. The next one in 10th place with four calls is four times where I had to replace the spark electrodes. And sometimes what happens is the spark electrode, it will crack. There's basically the white insulation, the ceramic insulation, with a little metal rod that sticks up on top. That's the thing that sparks. And if there's a crack in the insulation, the spark, instead of sparking up, it'll spark down. And you, if you look at your burner, you can actually see the spark sparking down to the burner instead of up. So if you see a crack in the insulation, then you should just replace that spark electrode and you should be good to go. But there are times where simply the burner area where it's sparking is completely dirty and just caked with oil or other kind of buildup. If you just completely clean that stuff out, brush it out with some sandpaper or maybe a brass brush, sometimes that's enough to make it start sparking to the right place once again. And the last one in 10th place is a bad spark module. So the spark module, sometimes it'll be below the top, other times it'll be behind the main console up here. You have to take the back panels off to get to it, either on top or on the bottom section or in the midsection right there. The spark module is the one that's responsible for sending a spark to all of your burners. And for those of you that aren't aware of this, when you turn one burner on, on a gas oven, you hear that spark? When you turn one burner on, all four of the burners are sparking. So for example, I can, turn, I can set this one to light, and then that one I can just turn on right away, and it lights without having to put it to light first. So if you have a bad spark module, most of the time, none of the burners will work. So you can try each one of them, set all of them to light, and none of them will be sparking. So if none of your burners are sparking, then there's a good chance that your spark module is bad. And on most ovens, that spark module is really easy to replace. Just look up a video of how to replace a spark module for your brand of oven, and you should be good to go. Well guys, and that is it for the top 10 oven offenders. And now I'm just gonna go over the honorable mentions that did not get into the top 10, and I'm gonna go over them a little bit more quicker than the rest of them. But let's just start from the top. The first one is no problems with the oven found at all. There was three of those. So I would come out and the customer would tell me, hey, the temperatures in my oven are not quite right. Something's not working right in the oven. So I turn it on to bake. I set it to 350 or 400, whatever it is that they use more frequently. I ask them. And then I stick my temperature probe in there with my meter. And then I monitor the temperatures going up and down for at least six cycles. And then I watch that little wave to see if the medium point is what I set the oven to, like I was talking about previously. And for those three calls, I found no problems at all. So the wavelength was just perfect. And I believe for two of them, the customer was actually using that round dial analog thermometer. And those, after a while, go completely bad. And they show the temperature like way off by 100, 150, or even 200 degrees. Those little dial thermometers that are placed into the oven, they don't last very long and they're not very accurate. So my meter would be showing 350 and their little thermometer would still be showing 200. So of course when the customer opens the oven and looks at it, they think that the temperatures are way off. The next one with three calls is a pan hitting the spark igniter. So on a gas oven that has a spark igniter in the bake section, so whenever you turn on your bake, you can hear it go tick, 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 and then it lights the burner. That little tick, tick. If you have too much pans in your bottom drawer, one of those pans, if they're sticking out from the drawer, can actually be pushing into the igniter, and the igniter is sparking to that pan instead of producing a spark at the igniter. So generally what you want to do is, if you have a bottom drawer, the pans that you put into that bottom drawer should not go over the borders of that bottom drawer. So all the pans in there should be below the outside border of that bottom drawer. I had one call where the glass on the door shattered and the customer said just for no apparent reason they weren't even baking or using the oven at that time. They were in the living room and they heard a loud crash. They came into the kitchen and that whole front glass on the oven, all of it just kind of busted out. 
Next one is a cracked ceramic glass top. I had two of those. So the ceramic glass tops, if they have a big crack in it, that whole top should be replaced. You can still use it, but depending on you know how big and deep the crack is, it might fracture even more. Kind of like that windshield effect on the car. You know how it just keeps spreading out and webbing out. The same thing can happen with your glass top. I had one call where the oven was stuck in Sabbath mode. And usually what that would look like is you'll have a 56 code. It looks like 56, but it's actually S with a lowercase b for Sabbath. And when the oven is in Sabbath mode, you can't really use your oven because it doesn't turn on. And the Sabbath mode is usually triggered by pressing the clock button and holding it for about three to five seconds, and that locks it out. And homeowners can sometimes accidentally put their oven into Sabbath mode and homeowners can sometimes accidentally put their oven into Sabbath mode. In that case, you just have to look up your brand online and look for Maytag Sabbath mode or how to take out Maytag oven from Sabbath mode. And it should be pretty simple. Usually it just involves pressing one or two buttons and holding them down. Or if you have a manual from your oven, you could also look it up there. I had one call where I replaced a bad door seal. So that's the seal that goes around the inside of the door to prevent the heat from escaping. And that door seal, what time it can get crusty and start to break. Or if somebody accidentally makes a tear or a rip in it, then of course it's not gonna be sealing like it should as well. And those door seals are generally pretty easy to replace. Replaced one of those. I replaced a broken door handle. The door handle was broken just because some little kid hung on it. I actually had two of those, two broken door handles. Replaced two of them, a gas regulator that was bad. I had two of those, that's behind the oven. So the gas regulator, if it's not allowing any gas through, then of course you're not gonna have gas on any of the portions in the oven, in the oven itself or on the cooktop. And that's what was happening with those two calls. Nothing was turning on at all. Replaced two gas regulators. I had two calls where the cooling fan was bad. And this is just for the wall ovens. They're the ones that have those cooling fans for the most part. I replaced two of those because they went out and they're not cooling off the oven. I had one call where the gas was simply shut off to the oven. The customer thought they were turning off the fireplace, but they actually went downstairs and accidentally turned the gas off to the oven. So nothing was working. All I had to do was simply turn the gas back on and make sure that everything was working right. I replaced two indicator lights. So the indicator lights are these little red lights. If you have an electric oven, especially, those electric ovens, if the surface is hot, usually you're going to have a little red light that glows red to indicate that one of the surface elements is hot, so you don't want to put your hand on any of them. And many times, the reason those indicator lights break to begin with is when you're replacing an infinite switch, the wires that hook up to the indicator light, when you pull on the infinite switch, the little clips that hold that light in place are really flimsy. So when you take an infinite switch out, a lot of times that little indicator light just gets ripped out and then there's nothing to hold it in there. In that case, you end up having to replace or somehow wedge it in there, that little indicator light. Next, I had three broken element receptacles and that's just the really old ovens that have that coiled element that you can actually pull out. So that receptacle where you plug that element into, I replaced three of those because they were bad and just completely breaking apart. It seems like with time, that plastic housing that houses that receptacle, it just gets completely baked and that plastic just crumbles. I only replaced one bad broil igniter, which compared to the bake igniter, which we had 32 of, that's quite a difference. And that's simply because not a lot of people actually use the broiler very often. So I actually only replaced one of those. I had two calls where the leveling leg was broken. So when people were moving their oven around, those little leveling legs on the bottom of the oven are just cheap plastic. So they're fairly easy to break. I had to replace two of those legs because they got broken off. I replaced two burner knobs and one of them was just spinning on the shaft. So it wasn't actually spinning that shaft or rotating that shaft. It was kind of just freewheeling. So I replaced one of those, or if you want to do a cheap fix, you can just wedge it in there to help hold it in place. And the other knob I replaced was simply half broken off. I replaced two broil elements on an electric oven. Then I had two calls where I just had to clean the burner slots. 
So for example, if you turn on your gas burner and one side of your burner has really small flames or maybe there's some slots where there's no flames coming out at all and the other side is nice, that might mean that the slots where the gas comes out from are just caked with scale and other kind of buildup or maybe some kind of liquid or oil got in there. In that case, you can just take a brush or even a toothpick and just clean out all those little crevices where the gas comes out from and that should fix the problem. I had two trip thermal fuses and these thermal fuses are generally only on wall ovens and unfortunately to replace or reset a thermal fuse you do have to pull that wall oven out. If you get lucky you can just pull it out a little bit like halfway so you don't have to take the whole thing out and set it on a table or something to hold it. But basically that thermal fuse it trips if the oven is getting too hot. For example, if that cooling fan is not working and the oven gets too hot, it'll trip that thermal fuse. If you get lucky, it's resettable. It'll have a button on it. You can just press it and that resets it. Other times, it's a one-time trip or a one-time blow. If that thermal fuse blows, then you have to actually order a new one and replace it before your oven will work again. I had one call where I had to replace the door lock assembly. The customer put their oven into a self-clean the oven locked the door and it would not unlock it. So I had to replace that whole door lock assembly and everything started working after that. And I had one call where the gas valve was bad. So the customer had called in a gas leak. The guys came out, searched the house for a gas leak and found that the gas valve on the oven was leaking gas by. And even with everything off, gas would still be slowly seeping out. So I replaced that gas valve, checked for any gas leaks and everything was good. And I don't have this one on my list, but I did have an oven one time that I literally just totaled. I said I will not work on it. I came out, I pulled the bottom drawer out, there was a bunch of mice poop, those little mice nuggets all over the place. I opened the top up, the insulation was all chewed up, the wires were chewed, mice poop everywhere. I pulled the oven out, took the panels off, there was mice poop there as well, wires chewed there. I mean, the whole oven was just a little mouse disaster zone. So after seeing all that, I flat out refused to work on that oven and told that customer sorry, but most likely you'll just have to get a whole new oven because all the damage in there and all that mice, poop, and nastiness, I just don't want to deal with that. Well guys, and that is all I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed this list of oven problems and you found this video helpful and useful. And if you remember any oven problems that you had in the past, that you were able to fix yourself or maybe somebody else came out and fixed for you and if you remember what the fix was and what the problem was if you could share with everybody in the comments below what that was and how you were able to fix that problem that would be awesome thank you so much for watching this video don't forget to mash that like button on the way out and we'll see you next time and if you're still here and not in the comment section below next week school is starting or at least when i'm filming this Next week school is starting, so let me give you a lame dad joke that you can use for some kids. Who is the king of all the school supplies? The answer is the ruler. But let me actually leave you with a better tip. Every single time I'm downloading an app on my phone, whether it's a game or some kind of note software, any kind of app I download from my phone, a lot of times as I'm reading through the comments or the reviews of that app, Many times people are saying, oh, this app sucks, there's so many ads, the ads are always interrupting, yada, 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 yada. I see that all the time. And I'm sure some of you already know this, but for those of you that don't, you're going to love this. If you just turn off your 4G or your Wi-Fi, many of those apps do not require internet to run. So if you turn off your 4G or your Wi-Fi, all those ads will stop appearing. So that's especially helpful if those ads are constantly interrupting and you don't need internet to run that app. Try turning it off and it's going to make a world of a difference for you.